Welcome to your session on surveillance for health behaviors and risk factors. My name is Matthew Romo. I'm a clinical epidemiologic investigator at the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. I'm a CUNY School of Public Health graduate, having finished my PhD in epidemiology in 2022 and my MPH in 2015. In this lecture, we will discuss why surveillance for health behaviors and risk factors is important. We will discuss data sources for the surveillance with examples at the national, state, and local levels. We will discuss this at accessing these data and finish with an application to ending the HIV epidemic in New York. This table shows the leading causes of death in the U.S. in 1990 and 2016, and it is from the U.S. Burden of Disease Collaborators. Look at the diseases and injuries in the left column and think about the underlying causes. This is exactly why we're having this lecture. There are many behaviors and risk factors that contribute to these diseases, many of which can be addressed. As a continuation of the previous slide, this is also from the U.S. Burden of Disease Collaborators. The figure shows risk factors in the left column and the bar represents number of deaths. You can see within each bar that each risk factor contributes to various diseases or injuries. Looking at the first one, dietary risks, you can see most related deaths are due to cardiovascular diseases. For the second, tobacco use, you can see most related deaths are due to neoplasms and chronic respiratory diseases. You can appreciate to address something like cardiovascular diseases and cancers, you need to understand the epidemiology of underlying risk factors. These are the things that public health can address to make meaningful differences in outcomes. On this slide is a list of the data sources used in the U.S. Burden of Disease study. This is a good segue into discussing data sources for surveillance on health behaviors and risk factors, as we will be discussing some of these surveys in greater detail in this lecture. We are going to start with national data sources surveillance of health behaviors and risk factors. Principal ones are the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFSS, National Health Interview Survey, and National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. All these surveys uh, sample civilian, non-institutionalized people residing in the United States at the time of the interview. Therefore, it is important to appreciate that these surveys exclude people who are active duty military, people in long-term care facilities, people in prisons, etc. And these populations may be relevant to your research question or the topic you're interested in looking at surveillance measures for. Importantly, these are not just national surveys and data can be examined at smaller geographic units like states and counties and others depending on the survey. The Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFSS, is the nation's premier system of health-related telephone surveys, which collects state data about U.S. residents regarding their health-related risk behaviors, chronic health conditions, and use of preventive services. BRFSS was established in 1984 and collected data in 15 states. It now collects data in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and three U.S. territories. BRFSS completes more than 400,000 adult interviews each year, making it the largest continuously conducted health survey system in the world. Here are some examples of data from BRFSS from your reading in MMWR. The indicator being examined is at least 14 days of poor mental health in the past 30 days. And the top of the slide is uh, table five, and this contains state level estimates. The bottom of the slide are MMSA estimates, and these are metropolitan and micropolitan statistical areas. And these are just partial uh, tables. The, the complete ones in are, are in your reading for you to take a look at. But just as an example to show you, in addition to providing data on the nation's health as a whole, 
BureauFSS also provides, uh, provides data in smaller geographic units like states and these MMSAs. If you go to the BRFSS website, you can visualize data in many ways. This is a visualization of the prevalence of current smoking in 2021. The estimates are age-adjusted and representative of the non-institutionalized adult population in the state. You can see that the prevalence of current smoking varies substantially by region. This is a news article about a study showing how data from BRFSS can be used with other data sources to draw some ecological inferences. Firearm ownership was assessed by BRFSS and is shown in the map on the slide. An external data source like on-the-job deaths among police officers can be combined with BRFSS data to look at various associations. When assessing these studies, it's important to think about some of their limitations, but I think this, this, study, in, this study in particular shows a potential use for BRFSS data, uh, not limited to just the data collected. Next, we will discuss the National Health and Review Survey. It has been used to monitor the health of the nation since 1957. Data on a broad range of health topics are collected through personal household interviews. For over 50 years, the U.S. Census Bureau has been the data collection agent for the National Health Interview Survey. Survey results have been instrumental in providing data to track health status, healthcare access, and progress toward achieving national health objectives. In the National Health Interview Survey, confidential interviews are conducted in households by Census Bureau interviewers. This is a big distinction from BRFSS, which is done over the phone. National Health Interview Survey is the nation's largest in-person household survey, household health survey, covering about 35 to 40,000 households and 7 to 100,000 individuals in each survey. This is a data visualization from the National Health Interview website. It shows the prevalence of cigarette smoking among adults 25 years and older from 2019 through 2022 stratified by educational attainment. Something to think about the National Health Interview Survey and BRFSS and other surveys we will discuss is what makes them different and how does this influence the data and its interpretation. Next, we will discuss the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey or NHANES. NHANES is a program of studies designed to assess the health and nutritional status of adults and children in the United States. It is unique in that it combines interviews, physical examinations, and specimen collection. It consists of a nationally representative sample of about 5,000 people who are examined each year from 15 counties across the country. NHANES began in the early 1960s and prior to 1999 focused on different population groups and time intervals. And be beginning in 1999, the survey has had continuous sampling. NHANES data can be linked to other administrative data sources like death certificates. It is used to determine the prevalence of major diseases and risk factors for diseases. Information used to assess nutritional status and its association with health promotion and disease prevention. And NHANES is also the basis for national standards for measurements as height, weight, and blood pressure. You might be wondering about the resources needed to collect data as part of this intensive study. In this slide is a picture of an NHANES mobile examination center. This is where participants are interviewed, undergo physical examination, and provide specimens like blood for testing. NHANES covers a vast array of topics. On this slide are some examples of diseases, medical conditions, and other health indicators that it assesses. Let's look at an example from NHANES and see how it provides unique data, for example, compared to the National Health Interview Survey or BRFSS. In this figure are NHANES estimates for diabetes prevalence stratified by sex. As you can see, there is both an undiagnosed and diagnosed categorization. This is a result of collecting both interview data and biological specimens for testing. 
Diagnosed diabetes is based on asking participants if they've ever been told by a doctor or other health professional if they have diabetes. Undiagnosed diabetes includes those with a diagnostic blood sugar or glycated hemoglobin level for diabetes who said they've never been diagnosed for diabetes in the interview. So this is a unique aspect of, of an examination survey uh, you, and certainly in a telephone survey or a in-person interview survey, you cannot assess the undiagnosed diabetes because you are not collecting biological specimens. Here is another example uh, from NHANES uh, comparing self-reported nicotine use with serum cottonine level. Serum cottonine is a nicotine metabolite, and certain levels indicate if the person has been exposed to, to the extent that they are likely a current smoker or exposed to secondhand smoke. This table shows the percent of participants who said they did not use nicotine products but had elevated cottonine levels. As you can see in the third and fourth columns, there are not big differences when asking about products containing nicotine. For example, when asking about all products containing nicotine, it seems that the difference is, is about one to 2%. In this example, it seems that self-reported nicotine is a pretty good indicator on its own. So this does show another uh, potential benefit of, of, of NHANES. You can validate self-reported measures like um, nicotine use. Let's look at another example that also makes comparisons with other surveys. These two graphs compare height on the left and body weight on the right for NHANES, including measurements and self-report, National Health, Inter survey, Health Interview Survey, and Bureau of Assess. On the left with height, we can see that both men and women overestimate their height, although women to a smaller extent. On the right, we can see that women underestimate their weight, and that most estimates of self-report are fairly consistent with measured weight for men. Think about the implications for this, especially for an indicator like BMI or nutritional status based on BMI. Obesity prevalence will most, be most accurate with NHANES using measured weight and height to compute BMI. Obesity prevalence will certainly be underestimated with self-reported height and weight be it from um, self-reported measures from NHANES, uh, National Health Interview Survey, or BRFSS. This table summarizes our discussion of these three surveys and compares them. There are differences in the surveys by the type of interview done, how height and weight are measured, if a physical exam is done, the survey frequency, response rates, and sample size. For each item, I think it is helpful to think about how each item influences the validity of the data that are collected. Let's shift into local surveys. The New York City Community Health Survey, or CHS, is a telephone survey conducted annually by the Department of, of Health and Mental Hygiene, Division of Epidemiology, Bureau of Epidemiology Services. CHS provides robust data on the health of New Yorkers including both neighborhood and citywide estimates on a broad range of chronic diseases and behavioral risk factors. It is based on the BRFSS. It has been annual since 2002 and uses computer-assisted telephone interviewing, and the survey takes about 25 minutes. Because of the diversity of the city, the community health survey is multilingual. Since 2009, the survey has had a cell phone component given the increasing number of households without landlines. The Community Health Survey is a stratified random sample, which includes 42 New York City neighborhoods, and the sample frame is constructed on a list of phone numbers provided by a commercial vendor. There are about 10,000 participants in the survey, and these individuals are weighted to the New York City population using census data. These are some of the topics covered by CHS. As you can imagine, many topics are consistently included year after year, but then sometimes new topics can be introduced or taken out depending on the health needs of the city. 
The limitations of CHS are the same as those of BRFSS. It is phone-based, so there may be language or cultural barriers despite having the, um, the, the interview system in multiple languages. Response rates have been decreasing over time, which may be a source of bias. Due to self-report, there, there may be social desirability bias or difficulty recalling past behaviors. Since it is a cross-sectional survey, we're not able to establish temporality or incidents. However, because it is done every year, you can look at trends and estimates over time. Let's take a look at an example of how CHS has been used to understand the impact of public policy. Take Care New York was a blueprint used to guide the Department of Health's work to improve every community's health, especially those groups with the worst health outcomes. Take Care New York had 10 core indicators. We will be looking at the second, adults who currently smoke. These are the different policies for de facto control as part of New York City's five point plan. There was an increase in enforcement of taxation, legal action, for example, enforcing strengthened smoke free workplace laws, promoting smoking cessation with entire health system, health system to provide free nicotine replacement medications, limiting tobacco marketing and implementing targeting um, counter advertising and monitoring tobacco industry tactics and program effectiveness. This figure uses data from BRFSS prior to 2002 and community health survey data 2002 and after to track adult smoking in New York City. As you can see, different policies are plotted and we can see how smoking prevalence decreased over time. This is an, ex this is an excellent example of how data such as that from CHS can be used to not only inform policy but also evaluate the impact of policy. We'll talk about another local survey, the New York City Health and Examination Survey, or NYC Haines. This was modeled after NHANES, the national one, and conducted in New York City in 2004 and in 2013 to 2014. The objectives were to estimate the prevalence of selected diseases and risk factors in the city to estimate citywide city awareness, treatment, and control of selected health conditions, to examine differences in prevalence, awareness, treatment, and control of selected diseases across some demographic subgroups, and to monitor the prevalence of environmental exposures. These are some of the topic areas for New York City Haines. It's important to note that the 2004 survey Health established baseline levels for important health indicators like obesity, diabetes, and others. Here is an example of data from the 2004 NYC Haines. We previously looked at diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes in the national survey and Haines, and here we are looking at New York City. Diabetes here is stratified by key demographics. New York City is a very diverse city, so it's important to track how indicators differ by race, ethnicity, and nativity to better inform policy and public health outreach. The diabetes data from 2004 New York City Haines had multiple implications. It increased public awareness of diabetes in the city via press releases, peer-reviewed articles, and other publications. It informed programs and policies, including strengthening rationale for primary prevention and improved public health guidance and quality care. It also guided development of the A1C registry, provided which provided anticipated A1C levels among persons with and without diabetes. As a side note, A1C or glycated hemoglobin is a diagnostic and monitoring measure for diabetes and is indicative of blood glucose in the past three months. About 10 years after the first New York City Haines, a second survey was done in, in collaboration between the CUNY School of Public Health and the New York City Health Department. Conducting the second survey allowed comparison to the previous survey in 2004 to provide a picture of how the city's health has changed over the past 10 years. Importantly, this information was used to develop and fund new health programs, introduce new health regulations and new laws, 
and educate the public about increasing health risks. The surveys we've discussed today are all publicly available. You can download individual level data for analysis from the CDC National Center for Health Statistics. This includes the VRFSS, the National Health Interview Survey, NHANES, and other surveys listed here. The CDC National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion also has data that also houses some interactive data applications. I recommend taking a look at these and see what's available. In New York City, public use data sets are available from the Health Department website. Also available is EpiQuery, which is an interactive tool to visualize data from local surveys. As a shout out to one of our recent MPH graduates, Madeline Carlson, she used data from the Community Health Survey to examine the impact of COVID-19 on unmet healthcare needs in New York City. This goes to show you how these, these uh, publicly available data can be used to do important analyses, including by students at CUNY like yourselves. Let's review some of the strengths and limitations of surveys to collect information on health behaviors and risk factors. Regarding strengths, these surveys capture important upstream health-related information that is often not available from conventional surveillance, like from notifiable event reporting or vital statistics. Behaviors and risk factors with causal links to health outcomes are what public health practice ultimately focuses resources on, such as uh, through primary and secondary prevention. So this is why um, these surveys are so important because they do collect this information to inform policy and also to evaluate uh, the impact of policy. Importantly, these surveys are population-based and can be representative of different geographic units. Consistency across surveys allows comparability across jurisdictions. So for example, in BRFSS, you can make um, comparisons um, across states, for example. These surveys are often conducted in ongoing fashion. So although they're cross-sectional, you can look at trends over time. Regarding limitations, self-report is associated with financial recall bias and social desirability bias, but can be overcome in resource-intensive exam-based surveys. So think back to our examples um, with um, looking at NHANES versus National Health Interview Survey and um, Bureau of SS with height and weight. I think that's a really good example. These surveys only include non-institutionalized populations, which, which exclude some important populations. So this kind of all depends on your research question uh, or, 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 or interest in a specific population for surveillance. So this is an important uh, limitation. Low response, response rates are problematic and can, can contribute uh, to uh, selection bias. Uh, for some surveys, this is um, becoming more and more problematic over time. I know for the community health survey, um, the, the response rates have, have dwindled quite a bit over the years. And finally, cell phones um, need to be considered for telephone surveys. And if not, that's, that is a major limitation. Just a final word on wireless only households. I know um, that probably includes most of the people in, in the classroom today. Uh, coverage bias uh, can certainly result from not including wireless only households in telephone surveys. And, um, you know, for example, we know there are probably characteristics of wireless only households that are different than households that have a landline. And in this slide, here are some examples of some differences. So wireless only households are more likely to have higher alcohol use and be current smokers. So if you don't include wireless households, this is obviously gonna be a major source of bias. Some, some conclusions from the lecture are, monitoring health behaviors and risk factors serves as a critical role for public health surveillance and population health monitoring. Several national, state, and local tools and systems exist. Data from these systems are often publicly available. And I encourage everyone in the class to go to the health department and CDC websites to explore. 
We are going to end with another example of showing the value of surveillance data for informing policy and evaluating its impact. This work was led by Professor Nash and the CUNY Institute for Implementation Science and Population Health. And it, we're specifically going to be looking at tracking and disseminating information on progress towards ending the HIV epidemic in New York, the dashboard system. On June 29, 2014, New York State announced a three-point plan to move us closer to ending the HIV epidemic in, in New York State. The goal was to reduce the annual number of new HIV infections from about 3,000 to 750 per year by the end of 2020. The three-point plan was to identify all persons with HIV who remained undiagnosed and link them to healthcare, to link and retain those with HIV in healthcare, to treat them with anti-HIV therapy to maximize virus suppression so that they remain healthy and prevent further onward HIV transmission, and to provide uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis for persons who engage in uh, high-risk behaviors to keep them from acquiring HIV. The ending, ending the Epidemic Blueprint recommendation number 29 was to extend and enhance the use of data to track and report on the initiative's progress. Please go to the link and explore the dashboard. I've included a screenshot of some of the metrics. As you can see, the dashboard allows us to track the three-point plan of ending the epidemic over time, seeing where we actually are and setting our goal, our target, to reach our goals. This concludes the lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.